Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 131 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. How's it going, partner? It's going pretty good. How about yourself? Fantastic. We're recording this on a Friday, so it's almost weekend time. Heck yeah, this is uh, the last weekend for us where we don't have a lot going on, so (laughs) try to enjoy it. Yeah, true to that. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that today. We run into more than a few meetings in the next week or two. Super psyched. Yeah, for a time where no meetings are going on, we sure are participating in a lot of meetings. It's kind of nice. Yeah, finally. Next weekend, we have two big state meetings happening October 2nd and 3rd. So first up is the FDLA, which is an all-day virtual symposium with a live panel featuring the one and only Barb. Barb. (laughs) You sound so enthusiastic, you know? Yes, I'm ready for that. We're going to be talking about life after the pandemic or during the pandemic. It should be super interesting. I don't know if we're talking after pandemic yet, or are we talking during pandemic i'm not exactly sure where we're at because sometimes i get a feeling that we're still in it yeah we are and we're trying to get out of it and a (laughs) lot of times you get a feeling that some people are like i'm over it i'm already out of it it's interesting i think it's post furlough you know when we really shut down and then open that back up and what happened with the doctors how did you bring the work back how'd you bring your team members back you know what does that look like now that sort of stuff. But we haven't met yet to really go over it. So I'm looking forward to it. But I think it's going to be super interesting. Yeah. Everyone wants to know your secret of how you had more work after the furlough Ugh. than you did before. So whatever that, yeah. that secret little piece is, please let everyone know. You got it. <laughs> the whole lineup for their all day virtual looks really good. So check it out at fdla.org. And the same weekend is the first that I know of in-person dental laboratory meeting of the season yes finally yeah last april right before this started you and i i think we both had plane tickets Mm -hmm. ready to go to texas for the dlat meeting and of course it got moved to this weekend now barb and i are still not going to be there due to the circumstances but we will be set up at the Argon booth remotely to record anybody willing to stop by and be on the program. We're calling it the live, not live recordings. That's pretty snappy. Did you come up with that all yourself? I did. All right. So if you're going to be in Texas and you're going to be at the DLAT meeting, which looks like a great lineup, and I think a lot of past podcast guests are going to be there, Mm -hmm. make sure you stop by that Argon booth and let them know you want to chat with us and just tell us how great the dental lab laboratory industry is in the state of texas all right looking forward to that too i'm looking forward to being parked next to my computer actually not at a meeting in my house talking to guests so it should be interesting so this week we talked to daniel alter msc mdt and cdt i tell you this guy's got a lot going on Daniel tells the story and the journey that takes him to be a professor at the New York City College of Technology and also the executive editor for Inside Dental Technology magazine. From learning to become a ceramist, to owning his own lab, to educating the next generation of technicians, and also making sure that those graduating are ready to work in today's lab, Daniel has a passion for the industry, and we were honored to have him on the podcast. So join us as we have a conversation with Daniel Alter. Dental Services Group is proud to support the National Board of Certification in Dental Technology and proudly promote certification for dental technicians throughout their national network of laboratories. The CDT designation sets certified dental technicians apart from others in the field demonstrating a mastery of knowledge and applied skills in the art of dentistry. Certification also raises the standards of dental health through education in all aspects of dental technology. At Dental Services Group, they believe dentistry plays a significant role in the healthcare ecosystem and is committed to providing solutions to benefit the overall health and well-being of the patient. 
Visit NBCCERT to learn more about becoming a CDT. And dentalservices.net to learn more about how DSG supports the dental community. And they support our podcast. So thank you, DSG. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We are happy to have on the podcast with us today a name that a lot of people probably recognize from IDT Magazine, but we also know him as a fellow instructor with our good friend Renata. We welcome Daniel Alter to the program. How are you, sir? I'm doing really well. Thank you, Elvis, and thank you, Barbara, for this opportunity. I'm really excited to talk. This is great. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So like I mentioned, I think almost every issue of IDT, your picture's in it. <laughs> I don't know if you write articles or you're part of the magazine, but we're going to get to that in a bit. Let's find out how you got into this. How did you end up in our industry? Were you raised in a dental laboratory? No, actually, I was in progress to towards dental school. And then I had a little bit of a lap in between semesters where I graduated my biochem degree in, uh, in a bachelor's of bio Chem, and I had about six months or so in between, rather eight months or so. And I went to work for a dental laboratory that is very near and dear. And he ended up being my, my mentor for many years. Unfortunately, he passed away. It was uh, Adrian Jerm uh, from Jerm Dental. Oh, yeah. And he's given me the opportunity to, to grow and to expand my knowledge and fell in love with it. Ended up staying in this industry and, and never looked back and was completely at awe and rewarded and continued to be. So happy that that turned out that way. Yeah. So you're on a path to become a dentist. Mm -hmm. You take a part-time job at a dental lab. What were you doing at this lab? I mean, you walk into this thing and you're like, hey, I want to be a dentist, but what can I do until that time? Right. So it was interesting. And a story I share with my students oftentimes at City Tech where I came in and, you know, I would do the the tasks that are in hand. And because I I previously, and I have to say, before my bachelor's degree, I I went to the same program that I'm teaching in now in New York City College. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I had two years of experience as a dental laboratory technician, rather education. And then when I continued on for the year and a half for my bachelor's, I still kept current, but not physically in a laboratory. Then with the premise that the dental laboratory, the restorative end is always going to be helpful in my dental career as a dentist. Then I came in and Adrian gave me an opportunity and he's just a, you know, for those of you that don't know him, he's just a, unfortunately has passed, but he's a, a bigger than anything kind of person and very generous with his time, very generous with his knowledge. So he gave me the opportunity and we've spoken a lot about some of the career paths that we're choosing and which way to go. And nonetheless, he put me in as a pressable assistant, which worked really well. So I was waxing up. I was doing a lot of diagnostics. I was doing, you know, learning and growing in the process. Mm-hmm. But one thing I did, you know, it was a, a kind of like a nine to five type of job and I would always want to learn more. I would always want to do more. So I would actually punch out and then stay behind to the technique. And ceramics was something that really called to me. Mm-hmm. I took the opportunity to then once I, I finished doing what I needed to do, I then approached these technicians and offered my help. And, you know, that's not always something. And especially in those times, it was a little difficult. People were a little wary and so on and so forth. But I approached it in a way that let me help you so you can finish a little bit earlier. And sure enough, they would first <laughs> let me finish a little bit of metal and then they would opaque and I would watch them how to opaque for argument's sake. And then I would take the next step a week or two later, I would say, okay, I've learned this. Let me help you get out a little bit earlier. Let me opaque all your copings for you. <laughs> and sure enough, within a six month period of time, I was already building up and contouring and helping the ceramist. And Adrian took notice of that and allowed me to do more and more things. Needless to say, within, I want to say, nine months of me starting, uh, no, it should be less because I've made the decision to not go to dental school, but I became the supervisor of the pressable ceramic department uh, Mm. within that time. And again, I am a big believer that, you know, you get what you put into something. And this is what I try to impart on my students as well is that, you know, nothing is necessarily given to you. You have to go after it. And that's always been my motto and always been the way I always look for challenges. And when somebody, you know, when I speak to somebody and they say it can't be done, to me, that just indicates that nobody's figured out how to get it done. And that is more of a motivation for me to push ahead and figure out how to get it done. So 
I enjoy challenges and I love growing. I love expanding. And that's how I got into the dental laboratory industry. So I was a supervisor there for about, I want to say four years at Adrian. And I was doing laminates and I was doing, you know, pressable and a lot of cosmetic cases, diagnostic wax ups. And ironically, that's how I learned a lot of the aesthetics that I, I did at Adrian's. Really. Mm-hmm. Every Saturday, I would come in and I would do uh, all the diagnostic cases, and he would be there on Saturdays as well. And so between the teaching and the experience that I've gotten with diagnostic waxing, which then correlated to my ceramic work, which helped a tremendous amount. At what point in your journey did you decide or realize that you wanted to be a dental technician and not a dentist? So it, it was a multiple of things, and that's a great question. It was a multiple events that have happened. So I've had eight months in between. I also, I must say, at that time, I was, I was with my high school sweetheart, and I wanted to get married. And that was financially, it was rewarding as I rose up with my knowledge and talent and took on more responsibility. So the decision was, do I continue on for another four years of education, take on the debt, or do I start producing now something that I, you know, I love? And my father, may rest in peace, always used to say, you know, when you do something that you love, it's, it never feels like work. Yeah. So that's what I found. I found something that I love, you know, and until today, I, that's the premise that I go by. If I feel passionate about it, I, I want to wake up in the morning and be able to jump out of bed and be excited for the day. Yeah. The day that comes that unfortunately, you know, and hopefully it will never come that I don't want to get out or I don't want to, I'm not motivated to do things. I know in my heart that it's time to make a change because that's what I want to do. And that's what I do every day. I want to be excited for the day and what I can conquer and what I can accomplish and what I can change. Great answer. That's how I feel every day. I am so happy that I'm in this industry. I wake up ready to go, supercharged. There's not ever been a day where I've left and been like, oh my God, I hate this. I just absolutely love what I do. It's awesome. And actually, just to add to that, and one thing that I forgot to mention is the thing that really, and I remember that pivotal moment where it was just that aha moment that we've had where I did, and as I explained, you know, I went through the process where I was doing helping out, but then I ended up doing a a large case for a patient, a full mouth rehab. And thankfully I was a part of that because the dentist brought the patient to the laboratory and we spoke and actually inserted. And then I received a personalized letter from that patient thanking me of how I've changed their lives. And that was it. I was, I was hooked. Yeah. Was... <laughs> that emotional connection. Yeah. Exactly. It's a big deal. And once you realize you can get that and not be a dentist, that's pretty cool. Because <laughs> right. I'm sure dentists get that all the time. But when it comes to the lab, it's super nice. We have a, a bulletin board full of the letters and notes we've gotten from patients and doctors, but patients are the ones that always stick out. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, and I still remember, you know, different times and I share this with my students where I was very privileged to be in the operatory room upon insertion. And, you know, it's the reward of seeing a patient completely change in front of your eyes and look in the mirror and having a smile where they've never smiled before, or they were very hesitant to smile before they would cover their smile before. And now they're smiling large and the tears start. And it's, it's the most rewarding thing beyond anything financial or economic that you can do. Just yeah. emotionally, it is by far the most rewarding thing that you've affected that person in such a positive way that will literally change their lives for the rest of their lives. So that was the bite that got me. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. What years were you running this department, this pressable department? Uh, so I want to say uh, 96 to 2000. Oh, so you were right there in the aesthetic revolution. Yes. Nice. So what'd you do after that? So after that, I went for a very short period of time. I went to, uh, I supervised for um, Murata, which I'm still till today, very good friends with Stephen Piglicelli, another wonderful, generous person that really teaches a lot and also shares a lot and is really open to just challenging and moving forward. He's Mm -hmm. always looking to innovate and do things. But I worked there for a little bit of time, I I want to say about eight or nine months, and then I decided uh, to open up my own laboratory, which I did so in in my parents' basement. I was only uh, 24 at the time. Wow. Uh, It was just myself. You know, it's it's the old uh, type of buy a porcelain furnace and a handpiece, and you're in business. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) True. 
it is. So, and, and in essence, that's what I did. And from there, it just grew organically. You know, I was always of the mind of providing a high quality for an average price, but always over deliver and under promise uh, what you do. So yeah. that worked and everything was through recommendations. And one way that I grew the laboratory, which ended up being a mid-sized laboratory of close to uh, 17 technicians, I would sponsor study clubs or I would sponsor lunch and learns and, Mm -hmm. you know, a a very inexpensive dinner or a lunch, but yet I got the opportunity to speak for 20 minutes to 30 minutes to a group of dentists. And inevitably, every single time I would walk away with at least one client, if not more. Mm -hmm. And I've done that regularly where it's grown rather rapidly, obviously, from me being by myself in, in my parents' basement to a a mid-sized laboratory within, a, I want to say about two two years or so, it grew that rapidly. Wow. So, wow. Do you still own a lab or do you teach? or? So currently, I don't own a lab anymore. I actually sold it back when I made a lateral career move mm-hmm. uh, into academia, which is now 11 years now. So, wow. which I'm happy to also say that, you know, as far as uh, in academia, I've risen up in the ranks there as well. And just recently, about two weeks ago, I found out that um, I received the, the highest promotion as a full professor. Wow, congratulations. That's Thank excellent. You. Oh. Thank you. So I saw the laboratory. I do. Should I reintroduce uh, you as Professor Daniel Alter? Is that, a, is that the official title now? or I suppose, but Daniel Alter is just fine. All right. All right. I'll, I'll re edit that later. Later. Yeah. <laughs> no, no worries at all. So yeah, I mean, I'm still very active, uh, obviously, not only in the teaching, but I have dental clients or dental friends, rather, clients that turned into friends that I have either an in-house laboratory that uh, they have in their offices that I come in and help and troubleshoot some stuff. I try to remain very active, but I also do quite a bit of consulting as well and and lecturing throughout the, the country as well as uh, some international speaking spots. Wow. You probably haven't traveled much lately, though, have you? Unfortunately not. No, I I do miss it. Uh, I miss it greatly. And I hope uh, soon enough we'll be able to to travel. And, you know, not so much the traveling that I miss. It's the, the wonderful people in the profession and just the passion. And we are very fortunate and very lucky to have such wonderful people in our industry that really help propel and encourage one another to really do better. I think it's uh, the environment has been better than it's been perhaps 20, 30 years ago. And people are more open to sharing and really collaborating together for the better good of the profession, which I'm, I'm very happy about. Sure. Yeah. Elvis and I were talking about that last week, how much we miss traveling and connecting mm-hmm. and, you know, the mm-hmm. whole face-to-face networking, sharing. It's really a uh, been a a tough year for all of us not being able to do that so i agree absolutely so when you got into teaching at city tech what was your first class that you taught so i taught several i mean ceramic was always the one that you know and i still i'm the coordinator for that Uh i think that one of the first classes i say because i came in as an adjunct first which is a part-timer okay and did that for a semester just to kind of get my feet wet and feel whether or not and i haven't sold my lab yet at the time i wanted to see whether or not this is something that you know i can see myself doing in forever sure in the future. yeah and then I, the next semester i was a sub and then after that i came in as a full-time but i think one of the things that they just struggled with was always the um removal partial denture class mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, so I did the ceramic class, I did the removal partial denture class, and I also did the dental materials class, uh, which was very um, interesting, to say the least, because I think I overwhelmed a lot of the students because I came in with a, uh, you know, again, a biochemistry background, and I, I went perhaps a little heavier than uh, what they expected with uh, the chemistry and so on uh, in dental materials, but it's... Uh, Gave a good background for them, for sure. Oh, yeah. I would imagine you overloaded them because most (laughs) dental technicians just know the material, not the chemical makeup of the material. Right. It's funny you say that because that's what attracted me to biochemistry. But specifically, because of my dental technology education, I wanted, I'm always very inquisitive and Mm -hmm. I always want to know why things work the way they work. Mm-hmm. And how do we change that? How do we, you know, the, you can always improve on things. So that was the deciding factor for me in, to get into the sciences is to really understand why things behave the way they behave 
And once I understand how they behave, is there anything that I could manipulate or alter to get it to behave in a better way? Mm -hmm. That's just kind of me in a nutshell. Um, you know, everything that I do, I always try to peel layers and get deeper and deeper into what is the challenge and how we can improve upon it. Wow. What college are you at again? Are you in New York? Yes, I'm in the New York City College of Technology, the restorative dentistry department. Wow. With Renata. Uh, yeah. Yes, so Renata. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. So do you guys have like um, mills or pressing units and ovens and the whole thing? Yeah, we do. That was one of the first things that I set out when I came on board uh, into the team of the restorative dentistry is they had a significant talent and certainly a lot of years and, and knowledge and wealth of information. But one of the things that as I saw is, you know, and this is back now, I came on in 09 as part time and, and uh, in 2010 as full. But I really saw the writing on the wall that everything is obviously becoming digital. I was digitally inclined. I was uh, doing a lot of things outside prior to that. And I recognized that as a school, if we're forming the, the future of what dental laboratory technology is, that we have to, it's our duty to make sure that they're most relevant and current in the industry. So one of the first things I set out, to, you know, about two years into it is creating a CAD CAM course, which there was none currently teaching as uh, in all of code accredited courses. So I set out, I, you know, reached out to a lot of great friends in the industry to get their advice and so on. I've traveled quite a bit. Mark Jackson, may rest in peace, actually yeah. helped me out a tremendous amount in setting this up. Wow. And I reached out to a lot of the manufacturers and kind of shared with them what it is that I'm looking to accomplish and what it is that I'm looking to achieve. And ironically, without naming any names, many of them said, oh, it can't be done. It's, it's something that, you know, it's a Single station, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't teach a class of 20, whatever have you. And again, as I said earlier, when somebody says it can't be done, just to me, it means <laughs> that they haven't figured out how to do it. Yep. <laughs> Anything can be done. So I set out and that's where, you know, I, I literally spent the three days with Mark Jackson's IT person that over in California and, and literally he and I just kind of brainstormed, brainstormed. Sure enough, we found a way I, you know, integrated some of the academic software into some of the design software. And sure enough, the same folks that, you know, after two years of doing that and, and putting together the CAD CAM course in a educational setting where I can control 20 laptops, I can see 20, not, I can see 20 computers and be able to remote into them and manipulate them and so on and so forth. It was a true classroom management style that the same folks that told me that it can't be done reached out to me and asked me how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Yeah. And then I saw that that was the light bulb moment when they reached out to me because I said, you know, it's great in New York City that we can do this. And certainly we've elevated our students' gainful employment, but let me help other institutions. And I reached out certainly with the NADL. We have the Educators Conference and I reached out to the chair at the time and asked them to just offer, you know, if I can be of any help to anybody to establish similar courses or classes in their institutions, I'd be more than happy to help. And and some have called for that and I'm happy for that. So wow. yeah, it's really rewarding. And, you know, at the college immediately, it was amazing. One of the things back in New York is that, you know, I was also responsible for the job assistance program. And I remember when I started and keep in mind that establishing the CAD CAM course probably took about a year and a half to two years because just the process and and going up through the ranks all the way to the board. But, yeah. you know, I remember in the very beginning, most of the phone calls and most of the emails were, we need a plaster person, we need a waxer. We need, and all of a sudden, something about a year, a year and a half of me being there, and, and that's why I really aggressively went for this course is because that dialogue has changed to now I need a scanning person, I need a scanning tech, I need a designer, I need a designer. Mm. So, that became more and more of a common thread. And I said, there's a void that we need to fill and who's better to fill that void than our students. And sure enough, yeah. that's exactly what they did. And, you know, they reap the benefits, both the laboratories as well as the students reap the benefits of that. I can tell you as a lab manager here in Florida, we're constantly looking for scanning technicians, technicians that can run the mill and that can nest and you know, you try to teach somebody off the street, but I mean, it's so much better when you can find somebody that already has the skills, you know, the knowledge, uh, but that's for sure. Our number one position that we try to fill right now. Yeah. Is scanner? Yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah. Well, well, we need implant scanners. I mean, we're doing so much scanning here. Mostly it's implants and then yeah. just regular yeah. scanning, high-end scanning, larger cases, you know, where you have to 
make sure the bite and everything's accurate. I mean, there's a lot to it for sure. Sure. Yeah. It's definitely not just a push a button. No. Does that surprise you, Elvis? It does. It does. (laughs) Why? I don't know. It just seems like you know, everyone's looking for designers or ceramists, yeah. and you're looking for the scanner. I just find that interesting. Yep. One other thing that I found that was interesting, and it certainly benefited the, the profession as a whole, but you know, I've received a lot of phone calls from lab owners that are either small or medium size that understand that they need to get into the digital world, but either didn't have the, the time or the capacity for the learning curve. Mm-hmm. And we've had several laboratories that were literally waiting to purchase their CAD CAM equipment with a student, for lack of better words. Wow. Yeah. yeah, And our students, as soon as they graduate, they were employed right away. And then they set up some laboratories with their digital equipment and ran it and are very successful till today in that department and in that laboratories. Wow. That's awesome. It was a win-win. (laughs) So what does the curriculum look like for a student? Is it obviously it's a two year program, but they go into that and then do they learn how to mill and then they learn how to contour? Take me through that a little bit, what it looks like to be a student going through the program. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we are a CODA accredited program, which means that the ADA is approved. And I'm one of the few CODA auditors throughout the country for the ADA. So But nonetheless, there are six specialties that we have to teach to the standards of CODA. Now, I can honestly tell you that we we teach beyond the standards of CODA, Mm -hmm. uh, which is wonderful. So we certainly hit the standards, but we go above and beyond, and especially in some of the advanced courses. But the way students progress through the program is they go as a cohort. So typically, we bring in about 60 students per year and graduate typically about 55 to 52. We've had some years that were as low as 45. We've had some years as high as 60 graduating. Wow. So at any point in time, there's anywhere from 100 to 120 students in the program for the two years. Huh. That's huge. Yeah, I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. They travel as cohorts with three sections, and they go through a series or a sequence of courses. Obviously, the first semester starts with a lot of dental materials, tooth morphology, basic crown and bridge, and lays on lays, and so on and so forth, to be able to get them acclimated and, and more so to learn the new language of dentistry, you know, what that means and what those things are. We make sure to teach them the proper dental terminology. And then they progress on and we scale every single, so there's three semesters of ceramics, but the first ceramics course may be full contour wax ups that they press and then they overlay a little bit. They may do a single coping. And then the following semester we do in ceramics, again, a a three unit bridge, two singles, you know, with butt joints and so on and so forth. And fourth semester, which we do a uh, six anterior smile design out of zirconia overlay. Wow. Yes. They're able to design it in the CAD CAM course. And then, which is in third semester. And then they go ahead and we mill their restorations for the ceramic course in the fourth semester. And that's the one that's that's the capstone before they graduate. And that tends to be their model to show their future employer as they go through an interview. That's wonderful. I love that. So they design it and then they finish it. They layer it facially? Correct. Wow. So they learn to contour. They get in a layer. They, they glaze it. Wow. That's great. Whose preps are these? Are they are they one guy that got an impression taken and the whole school does it, or is it? How does this work? No. So in the very beginning, the, the earlier semesters, we use educational models. Oh, so ideal preps. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Correct. In the third and certainly in the fourth semester, uh, we have actual impressions that we've been able to duplicate. You know, scale it to sixty students. Uh, nice. But in reality, they're they're seeing real preparations, some of the challenges, some of the challenges, the margins, space issues, and so on and so forth, because we want to prepare them as best as we could to enter the workforce once they do. Wow. Absolutely. I could definitely send you some impressions that will teach them to uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what not to do. So. Right. But the, those impressions are actually good because it teaches them to have the con- the proper conversation and what it is that they're looking for. Absolutely. And recognize what can be improved upon. And obviously, you know, that that's a whole conversation in and of itself to teach the students of how to adequately approach either the lab owner or the dentist, whichever have you, and how to suggest a better means of better outcome. Yeah. You need a whole semester of when to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so do you key in as their um, professor and, and kind of like individualize what you think each of the students really excels at and kind of help them go out to interviews and just say, you know, kind of 
direct it this way? Or do you find that they're pretty much good at everything? How do you help a student figure out what their niche is? Well, the, the nice thing is with the program is that they're exposed to everything and anything, including implants, including orthodontics, including removable as well as fixed. And right. By third semester, the students themselves get a sense of what is their calling and what they enjoy the most. Because one of the things that I always tell them is that you're going to be at work doing your craft and doing what you're working more than you do anything else in your life. Mm -hmm. So make sure make sure you enjoy it and enjoy it really well. So they kind of gravitate and they, and they choose their own kind of path in a way because this is what they'll be doing. So. Yeah. Then thereafter, they I'm, I'm in constant communication with them. They're constantly, you know, just more of a, um, certainly as a professor student relationship, but it evolves into like a mentor yeah. and tea type of relationship. It, and, and then even till today, I've, I've just had a text yesterday of a student working on three shape and struggling with something. And now when I say student, she graduated about seven years ago. <laughs> wow. um, so, you know, and within a quick exchange via text, I was able to remedy or resolve her the issue she had, and she was very grateful for it. And, you know, she went on to continue work. That's the kind of relationship I'm very open. And because again, that's the type of folks that were in my life as I was coming up in the profession. Yep. And I want to give back the way it was given to me in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like you're doing that. That's pretty gratifying to hear from seven years ago, somebody still uh, in touch with you. So that's, that's great. Absolutely. And that's also where it brought to me with the consulting and lecturing and then eventually to be the executive editor of Inside Dental Technology, which is, as Elvis said, my face is in every magazine. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, my thing is I'm always actively searching for different ways of, you know, new technologies, new ways or workflows to make things better, not only for the laboratory's workflow, but certainly first and foremost for the patient and our dental client. So, you know, that, that where my image is, that's the, it's a monthly column, it's called Elevate and Inspire. And it's little, little snippets of knowledge that I find, or as I travel, or as whatever the case may be, that I want to share with the profession and the industry with the hopes that they can, you know, grow from that and expand from that. Wow. Uh, other than that, I mean, I, I do write, I just recently wrote a, uh, a biomechanics uh, article that was um, last month was in IDT as well as in Inside Dentistry. So I write quite a bit for different magazines, but certainly um, within dentistry, obviously. But as the executive editor, I get to see and have a great input on what's coming in from some really remarkable technicians and the knowledge that they're willing to share is just awe-inspiring. Yeah. That's amazing. With your students, are you able to predict which courses they're going to excel at when you meet them early on? Yes and no, Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, because I have some assumptions, but uh, nonetheless, every single time people surprise me. Yeah. In a good way, I bet, right? In a good way, in a very yeah. good way. We have quite a few students that come from an art background. We have in our college, it also houses dental hygiene, radiology, nursing, and so on. So we have different students that come from different things where, you know, perhaps they tried nursing and they realized that they're not interested or even in dental hygiene you know, it's not exactly what they envisioned for their future. And they come and they see our program. We walk them around and we show them the things that we do and they, they take a liking to it. Many, believe it or not, their uh, apprehension for an actual patient is what drives them oftentimes to our program because they're not necessarily in somebody's mouth. Yeah. And also, one thing that we, we share with them quite a bit is the entrepreneurial model, entrepreneurial spirit that no other dental ancillary field has. We're the only one that can really, you know, a hygienist uh, always has to work under a dentist and assistant always yeah. has to work under a dentist. So dental laboratory certainly provides that entrepreneurial spirit. And we've had several students that come in thinking right away from the get-go, how do I open up a lab? And that's something that I, I love to engage with them because not only, yes, they have to build up their skill and make it, um, you know, the best that it could possibly be, but also, how do you approach from the business standpoint? What do you do? How do you build that model? And every single model is a little bit differently. Now, I have to mention also some of the background and what the consulting that I do is I also have a master's in uh, business management as well as organizational leadership. Wow. Damn, Daniel. Overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, I love the business end of things, um, yeah. the laboratory end of things and actually producing and being creative and, 
and creating smiles, but also the business end of things and how to have different initiatives and different things and, and look at it from different perspectives. Because oftentimes you may have four people in a room seeing exactly the same thing, but every one of the four will walk away seeing something a little bit different. Yeah. So that's the perspective. And, I, and I'm always encouraged to see what somebody else's perspective is and how we can better fit into that and grow as a, um, as a team, a profession, whatever have you. Nice. So what do you... Have you... Go ahead. Go. Okay. Well, I was going to say... <laughs> so do you teach the first year students? What do you show them to kind of get ready for our industry? I mean, you must have some people that come into it that really have no idea what it is. Right. So how do you introduce them to dental technology? So I typically teach the upper okay. level where they're already entrenched in dental laboratory technology. And I just keep stretching them, trying to have them grow and expand in in, in different ways. But you know, our field, or our industry, or our program, the majority of them, they know what a dental laboratory technology is okay. or which it is. Many of them come from family members that are in the lab industry, family members that are dentists, family members that are in the dental business and point them to this. Quite honestly, we have uh, probably a third of folks that are looking to reignite a career. So they were somewhere else. They spent whatever have you, five, 10 years, and they saw that that's not a trajectory, career trajectory that they're looking to to be in for the rest of their lives. And somebody spoke to them about dentistry and dental laboratory technology. So they understand that they're working with manual dexterity now with digital uh, technology sure. and they actually re- return searching for this program in particular. So I think the conversation of what is dental laboratory technology is, is significantly less because of the nature of the program. Nice. Do you have any dentists or like yourself who were looking to go into dentistry, but changed directions and decided to go into dental technology? Yes. Every year. Uh, really? we have, yeah. We have foreign dentists that come and, you know, for whatever reasons, they, they don't want to sit for the board exams again, or they different reasoning and they, they want to be in dental laboratory. There are folks like myself that chose that career path to get acquainted with dentistry before going to dental school. And in fact, probably at least once a year, uh, no, no, I shouldn't say that, once every two years, probably, uh, we always have a student that starts out and then ends up going to dental school. You know, they complete the the course. So they do the two year with us, they do the bachelor's, they sit for the DAT, and then they get accepted to a dental school. And we have some that actually come back as dentists and talking to the same students that were sitting in the seats that they sat in (laughs) years ago or eight years ago. So it's really cool. That's great. I bet you they are great dentists too, because they understand. Yeah. Can I get a list of the ones that know? (laughs) (laughs) But it's interesting with, with us introducing the CAD CAM course, we've had more than ever, we've had students come from different states because they've learned of the CAD CAM course. Now, those are typically that their parents are dentists. We've had, you know, including, I want to say about two years ago, we've had a, a brother and sister that came from a different state that their parents are dentists, but they chose New York because of the CAD CAM course, because they wanted them to have the more current and relevant type of education. And, you know, New York for two years is not a cheap endeavor. So they, yeah. they put them up and uh, for two years they and they graduated. They graduated really well and they're in their practicing um, respectively in in their family's uh, practice, which is great. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Love it. So we touched upon earlier IDT Magazine. How did that happen? Did they just give you a call and said, you got some free time? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually, uh, it, it was quite interesting and surprising to me. You know, I was called in to have a conversation about on the clinical side with what's happening in dental laboratory and with programs closing down and and becoming less and less and how the dentist may not recognize, unfortunately, that there may be an issue with talent coming up, you know, in the future. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not producing new talent in a new generation, over time, there's going to be a bottleneck where the dentists are going to, they need to be aware of it. So that was the conversation that I came in. And and it was several folks around the table and Dan Perkins, who was the CEO of Aegis, was there as well as Karen and Tony, who are the president and the COO. And the conversation just continued on similar to what we're having here and just kind of seeing the differences and sharing with them my perspective and how I see certain things could be resolved and certain things could be enhanced and become better. And by the end of the conversation, which was uh, several hours as we were 
right there and then at the end, Dan Perkins, who was the CEO, just kind of laid it out and said, how would you like to? And I was very surprised and obviously <laughs> <laughs> at all and, and very happy by it because it was a huge, I took it as a huge compliment and certainly enough, I accepted gladly. Wow. How do you fit that in to your day? Do you do that on the weekends or... A little bit of every day? A little bit of everything. You know, as yeah. I said, when you enjoy what you do, you know, it never feels like work and, you know, it becomes life. So, you know, between the consulting that I do and on the business aspect, as well as, uh, you know, material engagement and things like that, as well as the editorial and the school, it just, I don't know how to explain it. I just live life. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not so much that I have to compartmentize. This is, you know, this is this job and this job is just job. For me, it's all just who I am yeah. and they all fit in and one over the other do mesh really well. So even for the students as an executive editor, I bring them the most current and relevant things that they could possibly have. I mean, literally I can share with them things that is only, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, some of the master classes and some of the gifted technicians and conversations that I've had, I can relate that to the students and they can gain the knowledge of it. So it all kind of, comes together as for me perfect sphere that yeah. it's, it's which is just life <laughs> fascinating so you're pretty much into everything you are an overachiever which i love <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a um a diss at it by any stretch of the imagination uh -huh. thank you you must have inside knowledge on a lot of stuff coming out and getting ready to, and that must just feed your want to know more. Absolutely, because that's what, you know, in the human psyche and the human beings, I mean, we're motivated by challenges and, you know, challenges make us grow, learn and expand. And, you know, I live that every single day. And that's what makes me, as I said in the very beginning, jump out of bed because I know I'm having these conversations. I'm learning and expanding and growing and inputting things that may help others to do the same. Yeah, That's what excites me. That's what gets me going. And specifically on the consulting end, when I consult with businesses and whether it's laboratories or large global companies, you know, it's the same kind of thoughts that I have. Like, how do we expand? Where are we looking? What are we doing? And let's really peel the layers and inject our knowledge into it to make things better. Is there anything that's coming out or has gone out already that you find fascinating that you're going to maybe add to the curriculum? Is there something up and coming for your students? I mean, how do you keep your curriculum current, I guess, is, is my question. And that's a great question. So certainly looking at, obviously, the whole industry, we're, we're looking at 3D printing and specifically their materials and their technology and hardware. And that's something that I'm also, you know, so certainly we have scanners, we have mills at the school and now we've just uh, installed two printers and we already have a purchase for yet another excellent so that's the thing and i'm really encouraged by seeing some of the materials even if you you look at the fda approvals and see what's coming up the pipe it's really really exciting to see what type of things are people are looking at and what is the fda process going through and even you know, if you look at the trademark and stuff like that, you can see which company is doing what and what their emphasis and efforts are in. Wow. So it's very encouraging and exciting to see what's coming up. Yeah, you're on the front line for sure. Mm -hmm. Which printers did you guys get for the school? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've actually, now keep in mind, Elvis, <laughs> the school is a very, very slow moving machine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like we, we order something and then by the time it, it really arrives to us, I would probably say it takes two years at best. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. So we, we currently have two form labs that we were installing. Yeah. And we, we have uh, an Envision Tech that's uh, on its way. Yeah. Nice. You're not that far behind. We just got a form labs printer. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, specifically the thing that, we're, that I'm looking at right now is to make sure when what we're in, integrating into our curriculum is digital dentures. Yeah. And this semester is going to be the first time the students are going to be exposed to digital dentures. We use three shape platform. They'll be able to not only scan design, although let me take that back with the pandemic, it's difficult to scan. We're doing a lot of things remote. Yeah. yeah. So they'll be able to design and hopefully be able to output it and print it where I'm praying that by 2021 next semester, we'll be able to be back in and, and you know, they'll be able to see the results and, and be better for it. 
Wow. Where do you learn to do the design of something like a digital denture? If you don't have a lab, where do you get your experience to teach it? So I do have the software as well as the scanner in my home. Okay. And I am also a, um, a certified three-shape trainer as well as uh, ExoCAD and Dental Wings. What do you not do, Daniel? <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> One of the things for, for Zon Dental, I'm the, their advanced trainer for, you know, implants and three shape and bars. Holy and, and like that. So I'm exposed. I also, I'm an advisory board for three shape and I have several friends within three shape and so on. So I am very fortunate with the circle that I have around me that I, I'm exposed to these things. And again, not only do I grow for it, but I'm able to then share it with the students and share it with those that are looking to grow and learn the same way. That's awesome. Sweet. So the school is completely e-learning, I guess is the term, this year? Are they back or are they, yeah, that was my next question. Good call. So, you know, when, when this whole thing happened in early March, we needed to pivot quickly to online learning. I mean, we literally had five days to just convert everything, which yeah. was challenging. And, you know, we did the best that we could. But this semester started off, obviously, with having three months worth of really being able to record all our lectures and do everything that we need to do, which is house for the students. And then, uh, so didactic, which is lecture, we're going to, everything is e-learning. Laboratory, whatever we can, like the CAD class, we can remote into computers, so it's not necessary for students to be in. We're achieving it that way. However, the ceramic labs and the denture labs that are more manual dexterous, we have opened the laboratory. Yeah. Uh, the laboratories, rather. We have three of them in the college. So we're opening them up. We're social distancing six feet apart. Everybody has to wear masks. The instructors wear shields and so on, masks and shields. So we're doing the best that we can, but we felt it was important to have the students really engage in doing the dental technology end of things, the analog or the conventional, whether it's pouring up models, waxing, investing, casting, and so on and so forth, which they'll have the opportunity to do so. It's just going to, it's a little different where demonstrations were typically with, you know, 15 students around us looking over our shoulder. Now we We've set up cameras that we the students have to remain in their seats, and we're still demonstrating, but it's projected over on the big screen yeah. rather than them being over our shoulder. That's great. Yeah, it's a little different, a uh, little you know distance, but we're making it happen. I, I happen to not be a fan of uh, the term social distancing. I wish uh, <laughs> I yeah. wish the term was more physical distancing because social distancing has the social aspect to it, which I think is far from what reality is. I mean, you can physically distance by still being social. Yeah. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. So I think, you know, and last Monday, uh, this Monday rather, was the first time that kind of all came back. Obviously, we're spreading apart the classes, so it's not all together. But I can honestly tell you that it was a pleasure interacting with students and, you know, hearing their stories. And some of them were challenging and certainly frustrating and others saw the silver linings and things and actually were better for it and closer to their family and things like that. But that's what I enjoy and that's what feeds me getting to know the person and and hearing about their lives and changing some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see a decline in people signing up for classes this year because of the pandemic? Were people less likely to go to a college? So it's interesting. The college as a whole is about 10% less of new registrants for the new year. Okay, yeah. However, our program has seen a uh, robust enrollment. I mean, we're full to capacity. And in fact, we had to wait list some folks, uh, even while we're we're doing a lot of things remote. That is great to hear. Yeah. Because you always hear we have a shortage, a shortage of technicians. And to hear that you guys are at that point is really, really, really <laughs> makes me feel happy. Yeah. It's great. We need it. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm also currently working on, which, you know, is getting a little bit of buzz, is I'm, I'm creating a, a bachelor's degree in dental laboratory technology. Now, Damn. it's going to be a bachelor's degree, but in the dental laboratory technology, not in the way of similar to what the associates is. The associates teaches the fundamentals of dental laboratory technology. The bachelor's the way I envision it, and it's still very much in the work, so it may change, but Mm -hmm. uh, the way I envision it now is where we have three paths of focuses, for lack of better terms, which are going to be the sciences for those that are looking to continue on to dental school or, or anything like that. So this way they can have a true and clear path because the way it is right now, they have our associates to your program. Then they need to either figure out for themselves what they need for dental school, which are the physics, the chemistry, the organic chemistry, the biology, and so on and so forth. 
or they go to another sister college. And so, but we lose contact with them. So my, sure. my hope is to maintain that contact and to be able to mentor them through all the way through dental school and beyond. Wow. So that, that would be the science track. Then we also have, my focus would be a business track because we obviously, as I shared already, that's one of my passions. I love the business world and the business acumen. So to share that with students who may want to be lab owners or may want to work in corporate America and dentistry, whatever the case may be, they'll have business acumen in, in you know, doing everything from a business plan all the way to figuring out P&Ls and initiative and, and market launches and so on and so forth. Wow. The third one is going to be the technology end. So that's where I'm looking at the digital because, again, there are large companies that are innovating and creating different technologies for the dental laboratory industry. And, and what I hear oftentimes as I'm speaking to a lot of folks is that they have very smart, intelligent engineers. They have very smart, intelligent dental technicians that are you know, sharing with them what is needed. But there's a disconnect in the communication or the language of what that would mean and what that would look like. And my hope is that these folks that are going to be the students that are going to be in the, the baccalaureate and the dental laboratory technology will fill that void. So as I was designing this bachelor's program, I kind of looked to see where the voids are within our industry and how I can position our students to be in the best place for their careers, where they're, they can fill that void and, and be very competitive in that space. Yeah. Wow. And that takes it to a four-year program, right? Correct. So we're very close to it. I've already put together the skeleton. I've already put it through the provost. And, you know, there's a little bit of need to change some, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's and things like that. But once it passes that, it goes to council and then eventually to the board, and which could take upwards to a year. Mm -hmm. And then once they approve it, we can start bringing in students, which would be, you know, 2022. It was originally 2021, but the pandemic set us back a little bit. So I'm still hoping for 2022. Stupid pandemic. I know. You, you <laughs> so you guys will be the only college in the country with a four-year degree, correct? With a bachelor's? Well, actually, Indiana. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the one here at our state has it. Yeah, they have a, uh, and, and they're well aligned for their dental school, which is under now the, the same umbrella. Yeah, the IU hmm. school. Yeah, I'm assuming that their students kind of have a, a preference, but I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I know Brooke is the one who's in charge there and is very knowledgeable and can certainly answer that. What? I know that there was in Texas one that unfortunately ended up closing down. So yeah. other than Indiana, Purdue, I think we would be the only one, but it would have a different kind of focus to the program or the baccalaureate than what Indiana currently offers. Yeah. Congrats on that. Way to well, keep everything you. moving forward. That's kind of yeah. like what they say about dentists too, is that, you know, you learn to, to be a dentist, but you don't learn to be a business person. Right. So you come out and you don't have the skills that it takes to run an office. And so basically you've put all that together for our dental technicians. It's awesome. And you're right about the P and L's and all of those things. There's, so many of us there that had to learn that the hard way and to, to be able to understand that coming out of school, that puts them so far ahead of the game. Right. And that, that happens to be, Barbara, on, on my bucket list when I find some free time is that I'd love to write a book for the dental laboratory industry on business practices and business protocols and how to really look at it as a business standpoint rather than a craft rather than something yeah. that you know we love to do and we're all guilty of it because we you know some of us fall in love with i mean all of us for that matter fall in love with the craft and you know whether it's uh, the anatomy of a uh, you know the, the old adage of uh, the sing the, the molar uh, the, the technicians yeah. with the molar, the molar but and and that's great and you know and certainly something that should be continued and engaged in and and grow but certainly the business acumen and the business aspect is what will allow a technician to scale their business to to a different level that they, they desire. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. You are amazing. Now I understand why uh, you're doing so many things and your name's always seen in the IDT. It's really, really, really impressive. Oh, thank you. So would you say most students that start the school have that desire to be a lab owner, to maybe have that small lab that they control, or do they come into it knowing that there's a good chance that they might just be working at a bench for somebody else? So, yeah, I think it's a nice mix. Yeah. Uh, I would say probably the, you know, there's a handful that come in with the thought of being a lab owner. The rest kind of, you know, there are some that their family members are lab owners or work in a lab. And quite frankly, a lot of them are still just figuring it out. Sure. There's a few that want to be lab owners. And there are a few that never want to be lab owners, that they, they business is not for them and that's not what they want to do. And that's, 
they want to come in, they want to work for somebody, you know, make a good salary and go home and do their thing. So it really depends on the individual and what they desire and what they like. Yeah. No, I see that. Yeah, totally. Not everyone's set out to be an owner. Right. I don't want that responsibility. True to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I saw my dad do that for uh, over 50 years, and that's pretty much all he did. You know, he lived at the lab. When he was home, he was thinking about the lab, and there's a lot of pressure there, but sure. it's not for the week. But, you know, he absolutely loved it too. So, right. That's awesome. Your dad wouldn't have had it any different. You know, that's nope. just, the, but it takes that personality to be that way. And uh, absolutely. Well, and also, every owner needs a good handful of people that don't want to be owners working with them too. So, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Daniel, that's great. I had no idea that you were into this much stuff. I knew about the school and I knew about the magazine. That was it. And you surprised us. Oh, I thank you. Yeah, that's <laughs> some great stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just just quickly very fortunate because I, I do consult for several companies and share similar things with them. And, you know, I've built a, a little bit of a reputation and hopefully a good one um, that allows an insight of a different way. Because I'm also a big believer that when you look at the same thing, sometimes you only see one thing. And when you bring somebody in from a different you know, from the outside or a different perspective with the knowledge base, uh, similar to what you have, there's a refreshing and new way of looking at things that perhaps would provide a solution to the challenges that the company is dealing with at that moment. So I've really, I've tapped into that and with several companies and it's really been fruitful for both myself as well as them. Yeah. Nice. So any lab can contact you and say, Hey, Daniel, bring your expertise in here and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Absolutely. Nice. Any lab, I'm happy you brought it up because quite honestly, I mean, anybody, if I can help anybody, technicians, labs, companies, whatever the case may be, even if just somebody wants to just kind of get advice about their life, whatever the case may be, I'm always happy to be available and to be able to help in any way, in any capacity that I can. Nice. Wow. Thank you. I think everyone's going to call you when this thing airs. <laughs> <laughs> Be prepared to have your couch ready for all of us to lay down and just talk. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to learn all about you and your story, and we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's a it's a privilege and an honor, and I love the great work that both you, Elvis, and Barbara are doing. It's fantastic. Keep up the good work, and uh, thank you from, from me and from everybody in the profession. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks. sir. Hey, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully, we'll see you sometime. Yep. Absolutely. Hopefully, sooner than later. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye. Hey, Elvis. How is that Form Labs Form 3B printer going for you guys? It's still going really good. We are still cranking out models and custom trays on it. We love the ease of use. With the resin being loaded by cartridge and the free software that Nest and Ed supports instantly, it's pretty amazing. So you've been talking about it for at least two weeks now, and I think Night Dental needs to get some. Do you think that it could hold up with our workload? We've got probably two to 300 scans a day, and we're printing a lot of models. Wow, that many scans? That's pretty amazing. We don't even come close to that. But I feel that if you had enough of these printers, they could probably handle that high production. All right. But just a few weeks ago, they started shipping out their Form 3L printer. Wow, so they've got a 3B and now they've got a 3L? What do you know about it? Tell me about it. Well, with even a larger build plate, you can print a lot more models or surgical guides every day. And while the 3B that I have only has one laser, the Form 3L has two, so you can be even more productive. Sweet. And I was talking to somebody at Form Labs, and they are getting ready to come out with an orthodontic model resin that's going to significantly increase the print speed for those labs looking to get into clear aligners. Wow. All right, so that sounds like uh, what my lab is looking for. Can you go over with me one more time the website? Yeah, it's super easy. It's formlabs.com forward slash VFTB, like Voices from the Bench. Well, this will take you to a page where you can order a sample of something printed on a Form Labs Form 3B printer for free. This way you can hold the proof in your hand and see how amazing this printer is. All right, I'm going to do it. 
Thank you for your support of the podcast, Form Labs. We appreciate you. A huge thanks to Daniel for coming on the podcast. I think you and I both said a couple of times that he's an overachiever, but super amazing guy into everything, making a huge difference. And we loved learning so much about him and all the great things he's doing at the school. We're excited to hear about the bachelor program and see what the next inspirational thing that Daniel does for our profession. Oh, and thank you to everyone who purchased a face mask. Even though the foundation might not be getting the donations they got before the pandemic, it's important that we will still take a little time and effort to see that our industry succeeds so all of the labs can succeed too. And thank you for your brainchild, Elvis. I'm sick of seeing everyone's face. Yeah. (laughs) We might as well promote our business and our podcast at the same time. (laughs) Awesome, everybody. That's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. No, you can call me whatever you want. (laughs) I already have.